Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here. Um, during the session, we're going to talk about Kubernetes. We're going to have an overview of the shift that the industry does and the movement towards Kubernetes and how it's built and how it helps us um, to run and maintain our applications. Um, so let's start by talking about myself. Always a fun thing. So I'm Amit. Uh, I'm 28 years old. Um, and actually, I started my journey in this industry about 10 years ago um, when I got enlisted to the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Um, I started as a programmer. Uh, I did a course of uh, six months. Um, and my next step was to be a tutor in this course for about two years. Um, this is why I feel comfortable on the stage. Um, and then I went to an officer's course, and I got to a unit called Mamram. You might heard the name. Um, and there, I started by being the team lead of the cloud and virtualization environment. Um, we're talking about an on-prem data center, VMware solutions, vCenter, vCloud Director, um, and so on. Um, and we were responsible of making sure that all IDF programmers have enough resources and the ability to deploy their applications on the IDF data centers. Um, this was around two and a half years. The next project that I took was to create a greenfield open source um, cloud within the uh, IDF infrastructure. Um, so we used OpenStack with Ceph and different uh, open source solution. Um, and we started to touch Kubernetes as well. Um, but my major touch point with Kubernetes is actually in my current role. Um, so I finished my military service about two and a half years ago. Um, I traveled a little bit, um, got released, saw some South America. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then a year and a half ago, I started working at Spotinst. Uh, you probably saw our laces and everything. So yeah, we're spo sponsoring this event. Um, I'm not going to touch our products uh, during the session. We're going to talk about Kubernetes. I'll have just a short glimpse, two sentences about that. And then if you want to talk about it, you're more than welcome to come to our booth. Um, so at Spotinst, I'm a solutions architect, meaning I'm working with our customers to see how we can help them optimize their cloud environments in regards of the usage of different services and cost. So we want you to have, you, our customers, um, to have the most optimized environments as possible. Um, and we do everything in order to make sure it's possible. So let's talk about Kubernetes, or at least where everything comes from. So the agenda is going to be the following. We're going to talk about the fact that the industry is changing. We're going to talk a little bit, a bit about containers, where it comes from, what, what it's there to do. Um, then we're going to have a short overview of Kubernetes, um, talking about what it means managing a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about serverless containers. Um, and we'll have a short glimpse of Spotting's Ocean. We're just going to show the, the logo and talk about it a little. So. Let's start with the fact that the industry is changing. So a lot of companies uh, tend to shift their products from on-prem solutions that needs to be installed in the uh, customer's environments to SaaS offerings. The reason for that is usually it's easier to adopt. It's easier to use a SaaS solution rather than starting installing everything and creating the entire architecture within the uh, customer's environment. Um, and it's easier to scale, easier to sell. Um, this is why people put a lot of effort around that. Um, our world becomes much more agile. The development cycles are much shorter, um, and that's in order to be able to constantly deliver and give faster solutions to the customers. The fact that our customers can consume us through the web, through just a website, meaning that I always need to evolve and I always need to deploy new features, and I can't allow myself to work in the traditional way of developing a big monolith application, um, I have to be very, very quick. So then we are talking about CICD, some procedures that help you test your applications, test the changes that you uh, push uh, up the pipe, and then once the tests are passing, you can just deploy to production. So everything is automated. We want to have a very short 
lifecycle that will be as automated as possible. Um, and if we'll compare microservices to monolith applications, I've, I like using this example. Let's say I have a restaurant, and as you already know, I come from Israel. Israel is a very hot country, especially in the summer. And let's say I have a lot of people coming to my restaurant today, um, and it's a very, very hot day. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm probably going to serve them water. And usually they will want cold water, right? So they'll, they'll ask for ice. Now, I have just one big fridge in my uh, kitchen that both stores my food and creates my ice. There's like an icing uh, machine as part of the refrigerator. And now I have a lot of demand for ice, but my refrigerator can only generate a certain amount. What am I going to do now? Am I going to bring another fridge? I don't need more uh, place to save food. I don't need that. I don't have enough uh, place in my kitchen. I need to have a lot of... It, it's inefficient to bring a fridge once I don't need all, this, all its functionalities. So I can go to two different ways here. I can either bring a machine that creates ice. That would be a microservice, let's say. It will take care of only manufacturing the ice. Or I can go and consume it from a different source. I can purchase the predefined bags that you can buy in the gas stores and stuff like that, um, which is some sort of a SaaS solution. I'm just going, consuming ice, and then I can serve it in my restaurant. So this is the easiest equivalent that I could think of to, the differentiate, to differentiate microservices and monolith applications. So the industry is moving from having big monolithic applications that require a lot, a lot of time to, de to develop and to uh, deploy to something that is very distributed, a lot of different micro microservices that are attaching to each other and con having connections between one another. And then let's say I have a website and I have a lot of traffic. I don't need to deploy my entire applications a lot of time. I can just have more web servers to give the solution for my customers. If I need more backend services, I can just scale those. And it makes me much more efficient. And when we're talking about cloud, um, and specifically around cloud spend and scale, usually the cloud is very expensive. Moving to the cloud is not a cheap transition. It's going to cost a lot of money, but it's going to make you more effective. Your applications are probably going to be more effective because you can't allow yourself to cost that amount of money. So you're going to be effective, you're going to be dynamic, you're going to be able to scale up and down constantly. Um, and this is where we get to containers. So containers technically exist since the late 90s. Um, we all started hearing about containers around 2013 when Docker actually released their product. Um, so Docker, what they did is to take the container concept and just make it a commodity. They made it much easier to use. If we'll take um, another thing, Containers generally come from the shipment world. Like, we have big ships. In the, in the past, you had a lot of different ships that shipped different kind of equipment. Now, then they made the containers. And now we have a standard way to ship every, almost every product, let's say everything that can get into a container. And then you can just stack them one on top of the other. Meaning, you can be much more useful and much more effective in the way you actually utilize your ship. Just think about a ship that ships only toys. It's going to be a mess. You're not going to be able to ship a lot of equipment. Maybe you don't need a lot of equipment. So this way you can ship, ship a lot of different products within the same ship, and you're very uh, efficient. Um, then we're talking about 2015. Uh, Kubernetes was released the first time and uh, microservices architecture is being adopted widely. Um, this is how it went. Let's talk a little bit about containers. The good things, they're highly portable, which means we can take a container for one environment, deploy it on another, and it's probably going to work. Um, it's very thin OS, so if we're talking about the past, we used to run physical servers with one or two applications, then we uh, started using virtualization because they, we didn't manage to use the entire machine. It was a waste. So we started running VMs. And then when you're running VMs, you have a lot of operation systems that are replicated. They cost a lot of resources that are the same. 
So containers are running with very thin OS. You don't have a lot of overhead. You can provision them fast. You don't have to wait a few minutes for the OS to start. Um, they are consistent. As I said before, you can just move them around, and they will look the same. If I'll take the container from the ship and I'll move it to another ship, it will still be a container. And this is the main concept around that. Um, they're easy to deploy, patch, and scale. Um, and they help you accelerate your development procedure. Why? Because you just deploy your code and you throw it in the environment that you want. You can run the test around it. And if it's succeeded, you can run it to the, uh, move it to the production environment and it's all set. You don't have to do much. You just have to have the automated procedures and you can accelerate your development in a very easy manner. Um, the bad things about containers, so usually they are hard to operate and maintain in, at a big scale. Let's say I have a big system. Let's say I'm Facebook and I have like one hundreds of microservices and I have to manage each one of them at scale. You're going to lose yourself around that because you're going to have a lot of different components that you have to monitor each one of them and make sure that all of them are running. And it's, it's a big mess, especially if you're not using any containers orchestration, which is my second point. It requires orchestration platform. Um, and in, in another way to put it, it's new skills. You need to have people that know to deal either with Docker Swarm, with Nomad, with uh, Mesosphere, with Kubernetes, with any other solution that can orchestrate your containers and constantly make sure that you have your applications available and running and that the customers can consume that. Last point is security, and it's with a question mark because these days you have a lot of different offerings and solutions around that, but usually you'll need to adopt something and think about this direction as well um, because all your applications are running within the same OS. Um, something to, to bear in mind. And to the main point for today, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, or K8S, which is a shortcut for it. Um, the reason is the number of letters, by the way. Um, generally, it's an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Sounds cool, right? So. Let's understand a little bit what it means. So let's start by why do we need Kubernetes? So first, it's the leading container platform in the market. Me as myself, that I'm uh, exposed to many different containerized environments and or, uh, customers using different environments, I usually tend to see people using Kubernetes. Like The adoption rate is very, very high. Sometimes for a good reason, sometimes not. not. Um, it's open sourced which means there are a lot of people contributing to this specific um, application and the different features that are part of Kubernetes. Um, and a lot of people tested it and tried it and looked at it. So this is nice. It's built for high availability, and it's built for scale, meaning it's there in order to make sure you can run your applications in a huge scale. And it's very portable, meaning technically, you can run Kubernetes on every environment. It could be on-prem, it could be in any cloud provider. You have so many service providers that offer you Kubernetes offering that I cannot even start counting them. And pretty much every company that deals with infrastructure want to put their footprint around Kubernetes because of this adoption. Um, and this makes it a great product because a lot of people doing the same thing or trying the same thing means it's going to be very, very mature. Um, let's talk about Kubernetes architecture. Now, I should have a point there here. Is it pointing? No. Never mind. Um, I'll just talk about the different components, and I'll mention their names, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. So Kubernetes architecture is built on two main components. We have the master nodes, uh, which is the control plane, um, the part on the top. And we have the data plane. The data plane usually will have worker nodes uh, or minions, or they're called uh, slaves. They have many different names that could be mentioned as part of uh, talking about Kubernetes. Um, and if we'll talk about the architecture, Kubernetes is built upon different microservices by itself. So if I look at the master, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the API server. All the communication between a Kubernetes cluster, both to the nodes and inside the master, are through the API server. 
The reason it's implemented this way is that we want to make sure there is only one language and only one way to communicate between the services. Um, so this is the API server, and you can even trigger API queries and everything from the outside. The next component is the etcd. etcd is the Kubernetes data data database. Technically, it holds all the information of the different components that you're currently running on your cluster. Um, and based on that, it will constantly keep your objects running uh, and available. We'll deep dive into the objects in a few seconds. Then we have the scheduler. So the scheduler is there in order to make sure that once you have a new container that you want to deploy on your cluster, the scheduler will make sure to place it on the right node in order to make sure it's going to be running. So I'm talking about the nodes from the data plane. The last components uh, that I'm going to talk about for the masters is the controller manager. Uh, controllers are technically tools that make sure a certain uh, state is being preserved. Um, they have like an infinite loop that constantly checks if the YAML file that configures how I want my container to look like changed. If it changed, I want to verify that my container has the same state that is uh, configured in the etcd YAML and what's saved there. So the controller will constantly make sure that my cluster stands for the terms that I chose. And on top of it, we have other com uh, controllers that help you integrate within cloud environments. Let's say you want to have a pod, a container, with a disk attached to it. So you can just say that you want a volume, and, we will and it will create a volume in the correct cloud environment you're using, like AWS, GCP, Azure, and so on. When talking about the data plane or the worker nodes, um, we have two different services running there. First of all is the kubelet. Kubelet is the uh, agent, the Kubernetes agent running on the uh, uh, nodes, technically. Um, and all the communication is through that. And the other one is the proxy. The proxy is there in order to help the different pods and the different components running on the uh, nodes communicate to the outside, inside a cluster, um, and making sure that you constantly have communication within your cluster. Kubernetes objects. So Kubernetes is some sort of a declarative, declarative language. You configure your clusters through a YAML file, um, and then you create your different objects or services that you want to run. By the way, I didn't mention, but if I'm talking too fast, if you have any questions during my session, raise your hand. I'll give you the opportunity to ask the question. And in the end, we'll have a questionnaire or a, a time to ask questions. So really feel free to do that. Um, I come from a very uh, hot country, and people are very rude usually. So I'm used to being in interrupted. So really feel free. I'm here for that. Um, so Kubernetes objects look like that. So we have three different examples of different objects. We have a deployment, a pod, and a service. And let's talk about what each one of them means. So while talking about Kubernetes, we'll start with a namespace. So namespace is something that is a little bit problematic because everyone uses it differently. It doesn't have a certain role um, that is accepted by all. Like It could mean different services. It could mean di different applications. It could mean different environments. It could mean different teams. But generally, it's a group of different resources that you, as the user of Kubernetes, choose how to group your different objects, different resources. So you can use it in many, many different ways. Then the next thing I'm going to talk about is pod. Pod is the smallest deployable unit of computing. Pod will generally have one or more containers attached to it. And you can define the resources that you need, the constraints that you have. If you want it to run on a specific node, if you don't want it to run it with a different pod, you can just mention that. The next thing is labels. So it's key value pairs that are attach attached to objects. Generally speaking, everything in Kubernetes is built based on the labels. Like if you want to set any constraint, you're going to use the labels to specify the constraints. If you want to attach two different services, two different uh, pods to connect together, you're going to do it through labels. So it's used uh, widely in the Kubernetes environment. And then we have a volume, which is a, an abstracted layer of 
having persistent storage. Sometimes you want to run some applications that needs their storage attached to it. So you can use volumes in order to deploy either EFS volumes, EBS volumes, or whatever you need. Uh, of course, you can use GCP volumes, Azure volumes, or I assume that they have some integrations with on-prem solutions as well. Um, so you'll be able to use them too. Daemon sets. So daemon sets are generally a way to make sure that you have a certain pod on all your nodes. A few examples for that. Monitoring or logging systems. So you want to make sure that each node sends all the uh, monitoring events or the logs to a certain pool. You can run a daemon set and Kubernetes will verify that you're going to have this pod running on each one of your nodes, um, making sure that you, your logging system or your monitoring system is going to get those pods, is going to get those monitoring events or logging logs technically. Replica set. So a replica set those things are controllers, by the way. If you remember, we talked about controllers. So a replica set guarantees the availability of a specified number of pods. Um, so they're going to be identical. You're going to have several pods that look the same. Why would you want something like that? Maybe because you need to scale up another pod, because you want to be able to be as efficient as possible. So you want to have small pods that are going to scale to a big capacity once needed and available to scale down once not needed. So this is why you would want a replica set. Or we can talk about the deployment, which technically handles updates for pods and uh, replica sets. So it's easier to manage with uh, a resource or an object called deployment. Um, and it will constantly make sure that the desired state will be the actual state. So this is a deployment. Service. Service is an abstract way to expose an application running to uh, a set of pods or uh, an outside network. Um, generally, you can run an application. It could be widely available from the internet, or it could be only available through your uh, specific environment that you mentioned. Um, there are three different ways to, to expose a service. So you can use either a node port, where you'll use a specific port of the node that you're running within. You can use a load balancer which will technically create behind the scenes, if you're using AWS, it will create uh, an ELB behind the scenes that will expose your application. And the third way is cluster IP, where you'll, you'll be able to use the IP of the cluster in order to expose your application, or it will be internal, of course. Um, this is the third way to do that. Small sentence about core DNS from version 1.0. Uh, 13, there is a built-in DNS service within Kubernetes called Core DNS. So you can use it, and therefore, uh, all your pods are going to have actual meaning names. So you can use that. Let's talk about managing Kubernetes. Before that, do we have any questions? Awesome. Um, I, ho I hope it's because I'm very clear and not because uh, you don't want to ask any questions or you're shy. Um, but if you are, I'm going to be here the entire day. Feel free to reach out, ask any questions that you have. Um, I really want you guys to understand that so you can start using this amazing tool. It's really amazing. Um, managing Kubernetes. So managing a Kubernetes qu cluster requires a lot of work. Why? Because first of all, you need to learn how to create a cluster. Then after you created the cluster, there's going to be a new version. And then am I going to upgrade it? So it requires upgrading. And it requires constantly monitoring the environment and making sure nothing gets bad, like everything keeps running. And then that's for the, let's say, the control plane. Then we have the data plane. We constantly have to make sure that our data plane has enough resources to run all our applications. This is a headache. This is a headache. It's really hard to do. And there are many more things that are required in order to manage your Kubernetes cluster. So there are many ways to deploy Kubernetes cluster, especially these days, and it's constantly evolving. I gave some examples here. So we have two different approaches. We have the manage solution, or we have the unmanaged solution. So for the managed solutions, you have solutions like EKS, AKS, GKE, Rancher, um, many, many more, many, many more solutions. 
um, and different providers that uh, give you a solution, NetApp has a solution, uh, OpenShift is a solution to deploy a Kubernetes cluster from Reddit. So there are many ways, and the main idea around that is they take care of managing your control plane. So it takes a lot of the headache outside. You don't need to, like the creation is pretty easy usually. You don't have to upgrade and maintain the master nodes. You only need to make sure that you have enough infrastructure for your application needs. And then you have the unmanaged way. So you can do it yourself, which means you can go to Kubernetes Git library and start deploying your application, your cluster. It's going to require probably a lot of time and it's going to be fun, but challenging. Um, and we like fun. So if you have some free time and you want to experience some hard core uh, infrastructure, go for it. There are different approaches like KOps or KubeSpray, which are libraries that help you deploy your Kubernetes cluster. They give you some automation tools um, around deploying a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and this is the main two approaches. And then we have kubectl. kubectl is our terminal interface to Kubernetes. You can manage your entire cluster through kubectl. A um, few commands that I gave here. So you can get a deployment. You can describe a pod where you'll get all the uh, YAML file of it. Uh, you can apply a new service, a new YAML file that will create new objects and resources on your cluster. Um, it's pretty easy to use a kubectl, but you still need to understand how everything looks like. You need to understand uh, how it, an object looks like, the, the entire way to describe it. When we're talking about Kubernetes scaling, we have two different layers. We have the layer of the pods, which are the applications or the services that you're currently running. So let's say we have a web app, we have a lot of demand, we want it to scale. So we need to make sure new pods will be created. For that, we have HPA, which I'm going to show an example soon. Um, and the other layer is the infrastructure level. We constantly have to make sure that we have enough resources for our applications. And this is where serverless containers come into our life. There are many different solutions of ser serverless containers being adopted and being uh, published. Um, for example, Fargate, you probably are familiar with it. Recently, it was even released for EKS. Uh, up until then, like two months ago, it was only for ECS. Um, and the idea there is you can just deploy your containers and AWS will make sure that they are running, that they have the correct infrastructure. You don't need to deal with that. The main problem with serverless containers is that they're usually very expensive. So you're coming again to the cost thing. Um, HPA, short example. Generally, it will check your metrics every 30 seconds based on what you'll configure. Then if the scaling activity is needed, both scaling up and down, it will update the number of replicas in your controller, in your, uh, sorry, deployment or replica uh, set. And you'll have around three to five minutes cooldown between scaling events. But the idea is that you have a certain metric for your applications that is constantly being checked. It's generally a scaling, act scaling policy, right? It's nothing too special, but it works within your Kubernetes cluster. And then this takes care of running more pods of your application. Um, and this takes me to Ocean. This will be my last slide before the questions. So we as Podins, we develop a product that is called Ocean. Um, it's a serverless container solution, not in the regards that you don't have any machines. You still have the machines and you have access to them, but you don't need to think about infrastructure no more. And the general and the most important point here is we do that using spot instances. Um, and allowing you to use multiple life cycles and machine sizes and types. So we really, really simplify the management of the data plane for Kubernetes. Um, and this is all I'm going to say about our product. You're more than welcome to come to our booth. Um, it's right over there um, to see a better glimpse to that, more ideas around that, and how our solution is truly amazing. And it's not because I'm biased. It's because it's really an incredible piece of work. And uh, I'm trying to be humble here, but um, that would be it. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. There is a microphone that is going to be passed in order for everyone to hear the question. Um, so please go. Uh, 
Thank you for a good talk. Uh, my question is, uh, can you uh, highlight like most uh, common situations when people don't have to use Kubernetes, but they actually use it? Okay. Um, this is a great question. Uh, pleasure about the talk. Um, the main decision about which containerized environment to use, like if you want to use containers, you should use a containerized environment. But then you always have to ask yourself how much effort you want to put into learning your in infrastructure, your solution. Because once you have ECS, which is a very simple solution to run Kubernetes, you have UI for everything, it's incredibly simple what they did there. So usually what I do when customers ask me which kind of containerized environment should I use is I ask them what's their main goal, what's going to be the scale that they're going to run with, and how much effort they want to put around that. Because learning Kubernetes requires not too much more time, but it requires more time than learning Docker Swarm or Nomad or ECS because it's more complex. There are more components um, and it requires more skills. So th these would be the questions that I usually uh, ask the different um, people that will ask me that. Um, and we'll try to have a talk around that and then I'll give my recommendations according to that. So if you have a specific uh, question around that and you're actually in the process of choosing your containerized uh, orchestration uh, tool, just come by and let's have a short discussion. I'd be more than happy to assist. Any other questions? Okay.